Donc bonsoir et merci d'être là euh, pour cette euh, 13e séance du séminaire euh, à 1959-1985 au prisme de la Biennale de Paris qui donc euh, se déroule dans le cadre du programme éponyme, comme vous le savez, programme initié par l'INHA en partenariat avec les archives de la critique d'art à Rennes, avec la bibliothèque Kandinsky du Centre Georges Pompidou et avec l'Institut national de l'audiovisuel. Trois institutions qui détiennent des fonds d'archives euh, liés à cette biennale qui a existé, Biennale internationale des jeunes artistes qui a existé à Paris de 1959 à 1985, qui s'est terminée, qui n'existe plus. Euh, et l'idée de ce programme, c'est d'essayer à la fois de repenser cette biennale, de réorganiser, de mieux connaître ces fonds d'archives et surtout d'essayer de penser euh, euh, le rôle que les, cette biennale a pu jouer euh, dans cette époque de guerre froide et, euh, et aussi de circulation euh, des œuvres, des idées, des gens euh, et des... Euh, euh, voilà, c'est déjà pas mal, et, euh, et, et de voir ce que, ce que, ce que l'étude de cette biennale peut nous permettre euh, en matière d'écriture hein, ou de réflexion sur euh, des histoires euh, nouvelles ou euh, en tout cas différentes, histoire des œuvres, mais aussi évidemment histoire des, des échanges diplomatiques, des contraintes idéologiques, des, de leur contournement. Euh, et puis, qu -ce que ce, une des questions qui était très importante pour nous quand on a commencé ce projet, c'est évidemment de se dire, mais comment est-ce qu'on pense une biennale, euh, sachant que, euh, comment est-ce qu'on pense le rôle que les biennales jouent aussi pour euh, les œuvres, euh, comment penser ce va-et-vient entre le macro et le micro, entre le très grand et... et euh, entre une institution de plus en plus omniprésente aujourd'hui dans le monde de l'art contemporain et des pratiques artistiques, comment penser cette articulation et à travers ça, comment penser, comment écrire cette histoire de la Biennale de Paris ou ces histoires de la Biennale de Paris. Donc on a, on a abordé ces questions à travers de multiples questions au fil de l'année dernière et cette année et cette séance aujourd'hui, elle est vraiment particulière, elle est unique en quelque sorte dans le cadre de ce séminaire parce que euh, c'est la seule qui ne porte pas directement sur la Biennale de Paris, mais en revanche qui pose cette question de la biennalisation euh, de, euh, et de comment est-ce qu'on pense les euh, biennales euh, à travers donc, euh, euh, cette question que vous voyez en anglais, donc la séance se déroulera en anglais, euh, quelle lignée euh, modernité comparée, Venise et les biennales latino-américaines, euh, avec euh, évidemment cette, euh, ce, ce, ce modèle qui est toujours présent quand on prononce le mot biennale. La première réaction, c'est évidemment biennale de Venise, c'est la plus ancienne biennale. Euh, et c'est celle contre quoi ou par rapport à, quoi, à, à laquelle... Euh, se fondent ou se sont fondées les premières biennales parmi lesquelles la biennale de Paris euh, très, très explicitement dans les discours euh, dans les premiers discours la biennale de Paris est comparée à celle de Venise et à celle de Sao Paulo euh, et en même temps on peut se poser là donc l'objectif de la séance d'aujourd'hui c'est de se demander est-ce que quand on dit biennale de Venise on entend une chose est-ce que ça au fil des plus de 100 ans d'existence ça a été euh, C est, c est, on, on, on entend toujours c est, c est, c est le même référent, le même champ sémantique. Euh, et donc, euh, comme vous avez pu le lire dans le petit descriptif qui est au dos de la, de la séance d'aujourd'hui, euh, devant vous avez la carte dressée par Anita Orzes, euh, dont elle va nous parler euh, plus tard. Et au dos, vous avez le petit résumé qui euh, nous dit bien qu'il s'agit d'une question épistémologique. Existe-t-il un modèle unique et valide qui identifierait le format des biennales d'art, euh, particulièrement d'art contemporain. Et, euh, et donc il s'agira de travailler deux études de cas, donc la biennale de Venise, euh, donc la biennale mère en quelque sorte, la biennale matrice, euh, et on verra que, évidemment, ça ne s'est pas passé comme ça, mais en tout cas il y a cet imaginaire-là, et la biennale de, la, euh, de Havane, euh, qui... Euh, à, euh, qui, est, qui, 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 qui incarne un autre euh, modèle euh, qui, qui est de plus en plus répandu aujourd'hui, celui des biennales des périphéries. Euh, et donc il s'agira, comme c'est marqué dans le texte, d'étudier de près les récits et les mécanismes de légitimation afin de mieux comprendre ce phénomène à facettes multiples. Et nous sommes très heureux 
pour cette séance d'accueillir deux chercheurs, donc italiennes et espagnoles. Ah, deux chercheuses italiennes, alors totalement, pardon, deux chercheuses italiennes, mais dont l'une travaille en Italie et l'autre en Espagne. Alors, pardon, totalement confuse. Euh, donc, Sara Catenacci, euh, qui est historienne de l'art basée à Rome, qui a étudié à l'Université Ca' Foscari à Venise et a soutenu sa thèse de doctorat à l'Université Sapienza à Rome. Dans ses recherches, elle s'intéresse tant à l'histoire des expositions qu'aux connexions entre pratiques artistiques, architecturales et de design, pédagogie critique et engagement social et particulièrement dans l'Italie dans des années 1970, et comme elle venait de me dire à l'instant, c'est un champ qui commence à être étudié, à, à, à être euh, travaillé euh, en Italie en ce moment. Ses écrits traitent de la Biennale de Venise, des, euh, mais aussi des projets collaboratifs de l'architecte Riccardo Dalisi à Naples et du collectif Global Tools entre Milan et Florence, du travail de Gianfranco Baruccello et des exemples de solidarité internationale entre artistes et praticiens créatifs. Et j'avais ici euh, donc un article qu'elle a récemment euh, publié qui s'appelle euh, « Solidarity and Socially Engaged Art in uh, 1970s Italy » et qui traite justement de ces réseaux de solidarité internationale, notamment avec le Chili dans les années 70. Euh, elle a été commissaire, euh, alors je, je ne connais pas l'équivalent français, research curator, comme commissaire de la recherche, ou commissaire chercheur, mais, voilà, de la 14e Biennale d'Istanbul entre 1914, euh, 2014 pardon, et 2015, et elle collabore actuellement aux éditions Nero à Rome comme euh, chercheuse et coordinatrice des publications de livres et catalogues d'art. Donc on va l'entendre en premier, puis je présente tout de suite... Euh, Peut-être Anita Orses, comme ça on a fini avec les présentations. Euh, Anita Orses euh, poursuit actuellement un doctorat à l'Université autonome de Madrid, mais elle est aussi commissaire indépendante. Alors là aussi un terme difficile à traduire en français, gestor cultural, <rire> c'est ça C'est cultural management, oui, difficile à... Je, je, je... Enfin voilà. Euh... Manager culturel, non, c'est difficile. Enfin, voilà, donc du coup, j'ai dit commissaire, parce que c'est peut-être ça plus proche. Elle a étudié, les, là aussi, elle a aussi travaillé sur les pratiques curatoriales de la Biennale de Venise, mais aussi sur celles d'Amérique latine et des Caraïbes, et c'est là la spécificité de son travail, en s'intéressant en particulier aux façons dont... Euh, elle s'est aussi intéressée aux façons dont la Biennale de Venise reflète les changements sociopolitiques et économiques à l'échelle mondiale. Elle a plusieurs diplômes déjà, elle est diplômée en conservation de l'héritage culturel à l'université de Casposcoli à Venise, euh, en histoire de l'art contemporain et de la culture visuelle à l'université Complutense de Madrid et aussi à l'université Casposcoli. Elle a travaillé à la Biennale de Venise, à la collection Pinot à Punta de la Dogane et à la fondation des Amis du musée Prado. Et elle a publié entre autres en 2014 « Venice Biennale and its Cities ». Voilà, donc nous sommes très heureux de les accueillir. Et euh, juste une dernière chose, euh, si vous souhaitez être tenu au courant des, euh, du séminaire et des prochaines séances, je vais faire circuler une feuille pour ceux et celles euh, qui, euh, qui, ont, qui auront envie de donner leur, leurs adresses mail pour être tenu au courant de, euh, de, de, de l'avancement du programme. Et je tiens peut-être juste à signaler que la prochaine séance du séminaire se déroulera à Rennes, euh, puisque c'est un des établissements partenaires, donc les archives de la critique d'art à Rennes, euh, donc ce sera le 19 mars, dans un mois, euh, où on parlera du Biennale d'architecture et de l'architecture euh, à la Biennale de Paris. Euh, et puis ensuite, euh, la prochaine séance parisienne aura lieu le 2 avril, euh, autour d'un euh, événement assez, euh, là aussi, euh, très euh, curieux euh, et euh, riche en signification, qui est la participation des peintres paysans de la région de Houssien, euh, en Chine, à la Biennale de Paris de 1975, euh, euh, autour des questions de art contemporain et maoïsme, euh, la fascination de la France, particulièrement des années 70, pour... Euh, c'est cet art des paysans chinois et pour le maoïsme plus généralement avec les interventions d'une historienne de l'art, Estelle Bory, et d'une anthropologue qui fait son terrain depuis 
plus de 20 ans maintenant chez des peintres paysans euh, chinois, donc euh, Caroline Baudolec. Voilà. Euh, et puis par la suite, on aura deux dernières séances en mai et en juin. Ouais, vous avez le programme, on aura l'occasion d'y revenir. Voilà, je vous laisse donc la parole à Sarah Katenaji. Je vous remercie toutes les deux euh, infiniment d'être là. Je remercie aussi évidemment tous les gens qui contribuent à ce programme, dont vous avez les noms, le comité scientifique notamment, et puis les chargés d'études et de recherche qui travaillent à l'INH. Okay, um, thank you very much, Elisa, for this introduction, and I think I, I can start. And well, I would like to start with some images that are, these are actually um, frames of a documentary that may show you um, an unusual image of the Venice Biennial. Uh, this is um, a documentary film by Michele Sambin and Sergio Ballini and um, its focus is on the um, 1974 edition of the Venice Biennial. And here you will see like murals and other paintings in the Campi and Calli of Venice and no specific artworks like sculptures or installations or uh, like objects of art and the pavilions were closed. This is the fir first set, the first edition of Venice Biennial after its reform in 1973. And it's the first year of a four year program or plan that uh, opened the activities of the new Bi uh, Venice Biennale as a democratic, organized, independent institution. So with a new uh, rules uh, and new objectives. And this four year program ran from 1970 to 1978. And this moment in the history of the Venice Biennial, the, the 1970s, is now receiving more attention from the artists working with archival materials, from curators and art historians alike. This is an intervention by Emily Jazir in the 2013 biennial. It was a collateral event uh, titled Emergency Pavilion, Rebuilding Utopia. And she uh, presented this banner inscribed with the word Solidaridad, five uh, soundtracks reenacting the opening speech of uh, Venice Biennale president of the times, Carlo Ripa di Meana, and the mayor of Venice. And this soundtracks uh, with the speeches were also translated into Arabic, English and Spanish. And she also presented reproduction of letters sent by the artists and intellectuals endorsing the decision of the Biennale in 1974 to dedicate all the events to uh, Chile and specifically to the title was uh, Libertà per il Chile, Freedom for Chile. And this same editions, without the pavilions, without artworks, was uh, quoted by curator Okuyan Wizer as well in the uh, edition he curated of the Venice Biennial in 2015. And now art historians are um, studying and analyzing this four-year program and try to understand how this uh, reformed biennial of the 1970s modified the, um, the format that we used to know. When um, invited 
today to speak at this seminar, we were asked to draw up on our respective researches to expand on a methodological question that is common to all the researchers who are working on the perennial large-scale art exhibitions of the last century, namely the definition of their object of study, and most importantly, whether a single format ever exists, one with specific parameters and, and that characterize the phenomenon, and whether we can apply it when studying this object. Now, we call this format Biennale, as it has become a common term to designate all the different, and not always biennial, recurring every two years, art exhibitions, including Documenta in Castle, which recurs every five years, or Sculpture Projecta in Munster, that recurs every 10 years. At some point, it started to become a common term in the contemporary art world speech, almost a snack dookie, using the part in order to represent or point to a whole set of events. As crisis stands for a rich person, an almost mythological and every time subjective figure is utilized to circumscribe a complex and multifaceted cultural phenomenon and also to imply a genealogy, a myth of the origins. And this myth, or what Caroline Jones has called the Ur Biennale, is that of a Venice Biennale. In her research and essays and different contributions about what she defines a Biennale culture, Jones has traced a path that directly connects 19th century world fairs to the Venice Biennial and other recurrent exhibitions of the 20th century via their geopolitical ambitions, presentational means, their focus on the experience of things, power structures and narrative and mechanisms of national and international legitimization. Indeed, the exhibition apparatus developed by Western colonial powers in the 19th century also including different typologies of show and large-scale events, was a general reference for the national and international esposizioni that started to be organized in Italy in order to celebrate its unification and also create a shared identity for this very young nation. Italy became a nation in 1861 and in the same year started to be organized the first Esposizioni Nazionali, and then in the, in the 80s of the 19th century, also international exhibition of industrial art and, um, and fairs, and a lot of different kinds of exhibitions in uh, the Italian cities. Um, and these exhibitions, include the Venetian one, so it's, it was not an isolated phenomenon. However, all these um, exhibitions in Italy, large-scale exhibitions of modern times, they did not share with the world fairs the same immediate interest and acted on a very different cultural and political environment. And the same can be said of a supposed role of the Venice Biennial as mother of the many large-scale international art exhibitions that proliferated in the world during the 20th century. Uh, today, I'm not going to define any format or precise lineage. Rather, I'm going to highlight some moments or knots in the history of the Venice Biennial that are still to be untangled and that can be described as moments of discontinuity in the repetition of the event and in its conception, receptions, and in the workings of the Venice Biennale apparatus itself. To briefly highlight this discontinuity and complexity can be useful to understand how the common term, the sure myth of the Biennale, is not only arbitrary, but it is also the result of dynamic interpretations. 
that are still changing today and that cannot be freeze yet in a single notion or model for the purpose of its inscription in the history of the exhibition. And also the history of the exhibition and the history of the Biennale, large scale art events, it's very recent. So this concept that is now in the common speech of the art world, of the contemporary art world, I think uh, needs to remain still dynamic. But let's go more deep in what, in this, in this knots, in this um, moments of um, discontinuity in the in the binale format, or try to describe more in depth. Uh, what it is usually believed to be like a, a fixed uh, format. This is, for example, the, um, the plan of the National Art Exhibition in Venice. And it, is, it, it took place in 1887, and it was a national art exhibition um, in what now it, are called the Giardini of the Biennale, the garden, the Napoleonic Gardens. And it was um, constructed a temporary uh, pavilion that is not the one uh, you find today in the Giardini. It was a wooden structure and it was decorated in Art Nouveau style by Raimondo da Ronco, uh, who was uh, an Italian architect uh, born in Friuli, and he was um, started to work on uh, the pavilions for fairs, to de the decorations, and um, notably he became the, he, he moved to Turkey in 1894-93 and in 1894 he became the architect of the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. But he also worked uh, in this tiny image you can find at the bottom, bottom right. He worked on the decoration of the international exhibition of decorative arts in Turin in 19. O2. And you can see how the um, discourse about <coughs> exhibitions of art and exhibition of architecture and decorative art, it's, it's still very linked together. So the Venice, the Biennale is just another fair, temporary, with wooden structures uh, in the system of all the time all, all the fairs happening at the end of the 19th century in the young nation of Italy and this is instead the first international art exhibition in, nine, in 1895 and it was it was um, established by the city of Venice and uh, to the, the occasion was to honor the anniversary of the wedding of a king and the queen, but um, it became uh, notably um, a moment to um, make Venice modern again. It was uh, a, speci a specific choice by it, uh, made by an elite of uh, cultural practitioners and as a citizen of Venice uh, to try to bring um, the arti moderne and belle arti into the city of Venice and attract also tourism. This was a poster and also in the catalog of the first biennial there is um, indications about hotels or restaurants or uh, places where to stay. So from the start the international exhibition was had um, touristic purposes and the economic ones. The, the venue of the exhibitions was built by architect Trevisanato and was this main pavilion in, inside the gardens. The, 
the one of 1887 was destroyed, of course. And the first exhibitions showed a majority of Italian and Venetian artists. And beside the international participations. And it's used to say that um, the Venice Biennale uh, looked at the, the salon in, uh, in Paris or at the World Fairs. But now there are more studies in the archive and in the history of the Venice Biennial that trace links um, with uh, Austria, the suggestion, and uh, Munich, the art um, exhibitions that took place in the Glass Palace, in the Glass Palace in Munich, that was built in Munich for um, international uh, world fair, and then after the world fair, it became, it, uh, it was supposed to be a garden house, and that it became specifically a place for art fairs, only art fairs, and a forum and a place for international art trade. So, said so, this initiative of the Venice Biennial to, um, to show international art in Venice as a kind of, um, to bring modernity to the, the city of Ruskin and of the tourists in search for antiquities and kind of a nostalgia for the past was in fact a promotion of Italian and Venetian art because at the times it was organized by the major and the city of Venice. And, um, and aside, the international participation. And it was an initiative as a didactic one to, edu to educate the Giovane Italia, the new, the new nation. But it also had problems with the identity of these new nations. And in fact, in the first year of the 20th century, in 1901 and 1903, that, that is the same year of the International Exhibition of Decorative Arts in Turin, the problem of the regional, regional identity of uh, of the different cities and uh, art practice in Italy was, was still relevant. And they decided to decorate and dedicate each room of the central pavilion with the Italian artists to different regions. And so there was the Tuscan Gallery, the Emilian Gallery, the Veneto Gallery, each one decorated in Art Nouveau style, in a kind of folklore, tracing back to the traditions of each region of Italy. And this um, back and forth between uh, national identity, regional identity, and uh, a place in the word internationality was still a problem in the first edition of the Venice Biennial. And the same can be said of the of international pavilions because uh, they started to be built in 1907, the first one being the pavilion of Hungary and then Belgium, or oh, yes, Belgium and then Hungary. And they were built because the nation didn't have enough space in this cluster of rooms that is the, the main pavilion, that every, every two years it was decorated again and destroyed again and then reset in a new way. All the pavilions, uh, they were, 
they were built in different years and they also followed different um, relations in international diplomacy and sometimes they are built by the, um, the city of Venice itself and they act as extraterritorial uh, institutions like they, um, they have like embassies, they are completely autonomous and every time um, they, a pavilion were odd and they were run by the nation so they, uh, they needed to spend money to, to the, for the restoration, for the opening of the pavilion, that is still today. And uh, this implies that during the war or uh, for uh, other major political events when a pavilion was not used by the nation, it remained empty or it could be used by the Viennale for other exhibitions or other purpose. But now I'm always referring to the international exhibition in Venice as the Biennale, but in fact another point that is very important to underline is that the term by Biennale as a brand used by the institution itself was first put forward when the fascist reform took place in the 1930s when the Ministry of Culture of uh, Fascist Years decided uh, to um, promote uh, a set of exhibitions uh, in a kind of propaganda of the new Italy that were the Quadriennale in Rome, an exhibition taking place every four years dedicated entirely to the uh, Italian artists. The Triennale, the exhibition in Milan taking place every three years dedicated to design, architecture and decorative arts that was international and the Venice Biennale whose management passed from the city only, the city of Venice only, to the Italian national state. And it became La Biennale also in the promotional material. You can see this poster from 1932 and also the pavilion was, the main pavilion was rebuilt. It had the different names, Pavilion Pro Arte, Pavilion Italia, Italy Pavilion, now it's the ex exhibition, Pavilion Palazzo delle Esposizioni. And he, it had many facades and many different architectural shapes. So it's kind of amusing that we are using the term Biennale to try to focus and understand on, on this proliferation or large scale international exhibition dedicated to art with a term that was uh, used for the first time in a, uh, in a significant way by the fascist propaganda. Also, the, we think that the, the Giardini it's kind of a blocked space and the, usually the different projects that were made and the different plans the institution itself tried to put forward to, um, to change the structure of this exhibition uh, cluster. And they are not uh, very known and there were many projects by different artists. There were many uh, awards uh, and many prizes that uh, with winning projects that were never realized. One of this is the a project by architect Louis Kahn and it's a project that brings us more um, near the, the, the chronology that I would like to, to address in the history of the Venice Biennale that is the end of the 60s and 
the, the 1970s. This project was presented in 1969, and Alvar Alto was designing a new main pavilion, but most importantly, he was thinking about what he called the Palazzo dei Con de Congressi, a congress building uh, that was thought to be um, a place where different things could happen, events, uh, debates, exhibitions, congresses, all um, events to organize not only every two years, but during all the time, so that it came, the Biennale could become a kind of uh, permanent cultural institution, not just opening its doors every two years, and become a point of reference for the international debate, not only every two years, but a constant present, presence, sorry. <laughs> And th this brings us to the, the, um, the years after 1968 and the 1970s. Um, just when something very important happened, and I would like to start about, uh, to start to, um, to talk about this um, change in the, um, the meaning of a Biennale for the institution itself and for the public and for the uh, professionals from um, the first uh, comprehensive critical and historical analysis of the Venice Biennial as an organization or as a system. And it was published by Lawrence Holloway in 1968. And the, it was uh, published in 1968. It was going to print just during the, the opening of the uh, Biennale of the, that year. And then it was distributed the year after in 1969. And this Im very important book, it's titled The Venice Biennale from 1895 to 1968, from the salon to the goldfish bowl. And Lawrence Alloway uh, wrote this first account uh, using not only the art historical means of the, um, of the times, but also um, like the, the means of so analysis means of social sciences, and he coined for the first time the term artward as to analyze a network of people, of institutions, of artists, and he applied his notions of communication and network analysis to the study of the Venice Biennial. Of course, this. Um, this account, it's a bit dated now, but it, it is very important in the way he defines some qualities of the Venice Biennale. I'm talking about this book as the first uh, analytical account of the story of the Biennale be because there were other uh, stories of the Venice Biennale, but they were like uh, chronicles, celebrations, almost autobiographies, and histories of taste that were written uh, by the main characters of the different uh, editions of the Venice Biennale. The general secretary that was the, the most important organizer and person uh, inside the organization of the Biennale and also the director of the archives of the Biennale that wrote bibliographies and chronicles about the editions of the Venetian exhibition. 
And so we have an, a self-narrative of the Biennale as chronicle, as events, as celebrations or taste. And then comes this, um, this account that highlights four qualities are that I think that are this are still important uh, to understand um, Venice and also the, um, the large exhibition format. The first thing about Venice is that it is an entity in time. So it has a very uh, a changing content and then a uh, fixed, you can say for Alloway, structures that it's capable of surviving like political shifts. Then it has a multicellular structure that it is formed by the institution itself and then all the autonomous participations because all the national pavilions you will see also when Anita will speak, they run their own shows independently of the Biennale and sometimes a pavilion decides uh, what to show in an edition of the Biennale even before the title of the Biennale is announced because they, they start very early to plan their participation. Then for Holloway, the Biennale can be seen also as a social arena, a network. In, and he was, uh, when writing this, he was uh, talking about the post-war years after 1945 and, um, and the 1960s, when the, the pavilions were doing whatever they, they wanted, there was no a program, a common theme, uh, and the, um, the, the Biennale, the institution, one, was mounting retrospective exhibitions, historical exhibitions, and the city of Venice every two years became a place of gathering of all the, um, the artwork that was uh, that was um, a set of, of people and professional that started to exist in the 1960s and 70s as we know today. Those years are the same years of, uh, of the birth of the, um, the art fairs as Basel, the, the same that who are the biggest today. So the art world, as Lawrence Holloway termed it, started to exist in those years. He was analyzing them. And also, Holloway was speaking of the thickness of history, of the complexity of history. So like the, the Biennale, you can see every layer, because every edition uh, leaves a trace. And all this, it's, uh, it's uh, documented in its archive. And this with Lawrence Holloway and this analysis that points out how the Biennale is not just exhibitions every two years you can analyze in terms of philology or maybe to analyze the circulation of art objects or the, the different uh, taste in the different exhibitions, but also as an organization or social arena and something that produces information because the main focus of Holloway was about the network and about information and communication inside the art world. But, and this, you can say like sociological point of view, was something that was, um, that was interesting also for the Italian scene of the time. After, in 1968, you have all the, uh, the debate against the institutions, the movement of artists protesting. Um, you have, of course, the main movement of university students and 
but also in the in the cultural world, start, uh, the, uh, the institutions started to be contested. And the first one was the Triennale in Milan. In 1968, it was occupied by students, architects, designers, and artists, and they um, started to make assembly inside the building. They destroyed the exhibition, actually, of the Triennale in 1968. And they start, started to make debates about what an institution could be. And they also started to plan the protests for the 1968 edition of the Biennial. But what I would like to, to highlight now is that the debate and the protests were, uh, was about cultural institutions, but cultural institutions were also the critic, the critics, the art critics, the museums, the fine art academies, and then the institutional exhibitions from the fascist era, because still in 1968, the Venice Biennale had a fascist statute. And the, um, the, cre uh, the, um, the protest, or you can say the debate around the institution of art critic started from the generation of critics that you can say were the first independent curators uh, at the end of the 1960. Notably, Germano Celand started to uh, bring the, um, the um, theoretical accounts and the um, the debate against art critic of Susan Sontag and also the, um, the curatorial methodologies of Seth Siegelab in Italy. And what I'm showing you here is just a page from an article he published on Casabella that's titled Per una critica a critica towards uh, a critical criticism that start to complain against the art historians and art critic of the university and the academy in Italy, and then at the end put forward um, um, a kind of theory, a proposal, to address the art of those times, the contemporary art, neo-avant-garde, arte povera, conceptual art, as information, so without any interpretation or critical stance, but to build archives and documentation centers. He was very provocative. Uh, also in the 1970, he proposed to destroy the pavilions in Venice or to replace the old museums and institutional exhibitions with documentation centers with recordings, with um, videos and the pictures and all the material you can collect uh, from the artists themselves. And in fact, he built its own archive that he called Information Documentation Archives, at first in Genoa, and that this became his own very archive that is in, in Milan right now. But this um, debate was not only about an, a critical criticism, but also about the role of the institutions and the role of the documentation of contemporary art, the educational role in this sense. Another um, another magazine that was called NAC, Notizario d'Arte Contemporanea, was deba debating on these pages the possible construction of documentation centers in the different state libraries in Italy. They were very interested in the regional shifts in um, being 
uh, more close to the audience in terms of physicality, in terms of institutions in library in small towns, so to reach every kind of public. And the question of, of audience, of education, of reaching a more broader audience was important for the artists as well. This is just an example. There are many examples of social engaged art, of what we call now community-based art, but at the time it didn't have this label. And it was just, um, here in France, maybe you can call animation, uh, animation or animazione, uh, in Italy, and also projects, uh, artist projects in the public space. And this was um, a video made with interviews to the public of the 28th Biennale of Milano, also nicknamed the Permanente. And it was made by two artists, Davide Boriani and Gabriele De Vecchi, that were part of Gruppo T, that, mm, that was a famous group of cinematic art in Italy. And another magazine, this is uh, Data, published um, a comprehensive focus about the state of um, public institution of the arts there was also a big discussion about the academies of fine arts, so the formation of the future artists, the formation also of future architects in the faculty of architectures, and the role they could have had uh, in, in the society. So there are two words that are associated with art one is institutions, and the other one is politics. And at those times, you could not separate these two very words in Italy. So culture, politics, and the project of a future public institution. And then started also to criticize what happened after 19... 68 with the reform of the Venice Biennial because finally after um, a long process, a long political process because uh, they needed to, um, to write different proposals to the, to the government and those were not easy years uh, in terms of political situations and uh, there were the, the infamous uh, attacks, as the one in Milan in 1969, and others in the 1970s, fascist actors, and then in um, 1907, sorry, in the early 1970s, um, it, it was published a book by independent journalists. They were um, they labeled the strategy of the government as a strategy of tension in order to put forward emergency law and um, oppress the um, left-wing um, parties and movements. And uh, also, most importantly, to realize a coup d'etat from the, um, that of course failed, luckily, and, um, and so this, these were not easier and the, um, all, also the artists and all the audience of, uh, and the professionals were uh, like living in, uh, in a situation they were feeling like that from the one day to the other that could be a coup d'etat in Italy as well. Why I'm saying Italy as well, because um, with the death of Allende in 1973, they felt that the same could happen in Italy as well. And
and I'm going, <laughs> I'm, I'm, maybe I'm going too fast. That, uh, what was I saying, and that this was the political situation in Italy when they tried to put forward the reform of a statue of the Biennale. And it took several years and several proposals, and finally, in 1973, it was approved by the government. And so the Biennale became an autonomous cultural institute, and it was termed as a democratic cultural institution. There was, a, there was a new president, there were different commissions mixing artists, professional, critics. It was a bit of a huge bureaucratic system with like quotes or percentage from uh, left-wing artists, other artists or critics related to other parties, journalists from the national television, but also international uh, professionals. But all this process took a lot of years. And the main thing of this democratic in new Biennale, this democratic organized institution, is that it was formed with the idea to establish a permanent cultural institution. It was a try. It was a try with reference to the debate I was discussing before, that about documentation archives, that about didactic, uh, didactic and educational institutions, about the um, polemics against the single events or the, recu or, or the event management. They wanted something that could program, could present cultural initiatives every day. And this, because I was bringing together magazines, and what the Biennale produced instead, they produced a lot in the 1970s, that this is the most important document we have from those years, that is the, um, the yearbook, or the yearbooks. There is the one of 1975 related to events, to all the events organized in 1974. There is the one of 1976, another big one of uh, 1977 and 1978, and another one. And the particularity of this yearbooks is that they are instruments uh, with which the Biennale presents itself to this broader audience that it wanted to reach. So in this huge yearbooks, you have all the, uh, the rules, the different decrees that brought the, uh, the reform of the Biennale. Then you have all the different uh, legal proceedings, and then you have the, um, the budget of the Biennale, but also you have the official uh, presentation and discourses of the president. You have a resume of all the activities. Then you have pictures, then you have external contributions that are like focus of a topic discussed in the editions of the Biennale, and then also you have historical accounts about the Biennale, about the, the different pavilions, about the venues of the Biennale. So they were, for the first time, also writing the story of their architect, uh, architectonical spaces, for example. The first document you have for the story of uh, pavilions 
in Venice, you can find it here or in another booklet that is separated, but these are the same years. So, with the description of this instrument, I would like to um, make you understand the, um, how it was important, this reform, and how it was like embedded in a broader discourse about institution that happened in Italy, but it also happened um, in Europe and in the world at large. And it could be interesting to uh, connect the dots between this uh, concept of permanent cultural institutions and what has been done more or less in the same year, for example, in Paris by Pierre Godibert or the planning of the construction and organization of Saint Pompidou in the 1970s. This is a very interesting connection because Puntos Hulten was on the board of, um, in the commission of this new reformed Biennale. And together him, with him, uh, it was uh, Arroyo, a Spanish painter, it was in exile in Paris, together with other artists uh, and um, we'll see curators or art historians from Italy. And what is very interesting is that the, um, there was no more the general secretary for the art exhibition, but there was a director. So uh, an intellectual, uh, someone that could um, uh, propose a shape or a theme or a topic for the exhibition. And this, uh, we will, I, I will go more in depth about, about this for the exhibition of 1976, but let's start with 1974. Um, these are two posters, and <coughs> in, uh, as I said, in 1974, the, the pavilions were closed because the new uh, rules of the Biennale were approved very late, so they didn't have the time to open the pavilions, to, to be in touch with all the nations, and also the new uh, rule uh, was creating some problems with the, the, org the practical management of the international participations. But they decided to organize an edition as well, and it was a bit um, organized on, on the blueprint of the, um, the um, cinema festival that took place in uh, uh, in Pesaro and, uh, and also in Venice uh, in, uh, in, at the end of the 1960s, it, that it was completely self-organized by professionals and art critics and film directors. So it was uh, a set of events organized by, by the Biennale, but spread in the city of Venice. And uh, this is, for example, Roberto Matta, who is, was participating in this, um, in this edition dedicated to the freedom to Chile, uh, and painting murals together with the Brigada Salvador Allende. And also, uh, a lot of uh, people exiled in Europe were, were asked to come to, to Venice and to um, bring their um, testimony of what happened uh, on the coup d'etat and uh, what was the situation of the people in exile and of the artists of culture and um, this tie between Italy and Chile is very important and also this um, 
this way of organize, organizing a kind of uh, event in solidarity with, it, it reminds of the initiative of the Museo della Solidaridad, Salvatore Allende, and what was organized in Chile and outside of it after the coup d'etat, connecting different artists uh, from di different nations in the world in the name of solidarity. So it was a different kind of internationality from that of the past editions of the Biennale. It was no more the modern cosmopolitan internationality, but it had um, a common shared uh, ethical notion that was like bringing together all different practi practitioners. And another very important um, quality of this new Biennale of this four-year plans that I was talking at the beginning, um, the new four-year plan of the, of the reformed institution was that of the uh, maintenance and um, utilizations of empty spaces in the city of Venice, so outside of the Giardini. Here is the opening of Salonia le Zattere, two old buildings um, in the city of Venice that were like store buildings. And these were restored and opened by the Biennale to the public and to the city of Venice. In one of them was organized a photography exhibition. And this is also important because different media from sculpture or painting or drawing were not very much present in Venice. And it's very significant that the first exhibition organized in the Salonia Le Zattri was a, an exhibition of a photographer, Hugo Mulas, who became famous, who, who was renowned to be the photographer of the Biennale, especially in the 1950s and 1960s, of the artist and of all the network of the social arena of the, the exhibition in Venice. And this photographic exhibition showed Le Verifiche did its very particular series of photographs by Mulas, but also the history of Venice biennial until the end of the 1960s through the pictures of Mulas. So it's also a kind of retrospective eye to what the Biennale was before the reform. And then the other uh, room of the Salonia Lezzatri was dedicated to an architecture exhibition, an ar architecture exhibition through the medium of cinema. So how film, uh, was investigating the city, the modern city. So you have just the screen and you have the seats for the people. And also the topic of architecture is very important because the director of the art and architecture sector of the new Biennale was an architect himself, Vittorio Gregotti. This was a very contested deci decision uh, because he was not an art historian, he was not an art critic, but he was a professional that was outside all the dynamics of the academies of fine arts of the artists. So the president of the Biennale, who was politician for the first time, a politician and an intellectual. He was uh, also the, and a nobleman, Carlo 
uh, Ripa Di Meana, and he was also a friend with many intellectuals as he uh, used to work as an editor for the publishing house Rizzoli in Milano, and he had many ties with all the Milanese and Roman um, intellectual scene and with artists and architects. And he chose Gregotti, an architect, to direct the visual arts and architecture sector of the Venice Biennale. Again, in 1974, with the events related to Freedom to Chile were organized also scattered performances, uh, investigation, urban investigations in the city of Venice, uh, educational activities for kids, for the schools in uh, Mestre in the mainland or in other cities, and one of the performances that were organized was um, What is Fascism by uh, Italian artist Fabio Mauri. And it was a performance that took place in a temporary building in Campo San Polo in Venice. And this performance was um, realized for the first time in 1971 in Rome and then it was reenacted again in Venice in 1974. Again, you have a kind of reflection, a, re a retrospective eye about what was Italy before, about what was the education, the cultural education of young Italians, and what happened in the years before all this tradition that was kind that was um, was something that you don't have to speak about in those times instead in the 1970s this became a central topic also about the italian identity so it is a contested identity not because of regionalism <laughs> as we have seen at the beginnings of the Venice Biennale, but because the history of Italy itself and the different ideologies and, of course, the ideology of, a, of a fascism. In 1975, again, the pavilion were closed and the Biennale gave itself a very interesting title that was an international laboratory or international workshop. In the first black poster you see you have a collage of different pictures of the events of the year before. So again you have Matta, again you have Fabio Mauri, again you have the photos of Mulas. So the international workshop was the year before as well. And then you have Biennale and International Workshop in 1975. What is interesting uh, is that these editions didn't have a number. They were called B74, B75, B76, etc., etc. And also their image was different the design of all the posters, all the graphic materials. There was not more the word esposizione, exhibition, but it was just la biennale. So a single institution becoming a workshop, a platform for internationality that was organizing uh, events, activities, and but also documenting them about theater, music. It was organizing educational activities, information activities, activities of um, cinema projection, film projection, activities and shows, including shows about visual arts and architecture and design. So this was the concept of a new institution of those times. And the, since the, the pavilions were still closed, the Biennale 
used the new spaces of the Saloni and Lezzatere to install international cutting edge exhibition like uh, the Bachelor Machines of Aral Zeman, for example, that was traveling through different institutions as co-production. But another initiative was uh, one about a specific building in Venice that is the Mulino Stucchi. It was an industrial mill um, near the Canale della Giudecca and artists and designers were asked to uh, design projects for this particular building and there was a show about these uh, projects and there were also performances and artworks installed there. So uh, the Biennale was also asking architects and artists to reinvent the city itself and reinventing the city, also reinventing ro the role of this institution that was the democratic um, Venice Biennale. And while organizing these scattered events in 1974 and 1975, the president of the Biennale and the different directors of the different sectors, Luca Ronconi was the director of the section dedicated to theater, for example, they were thinking of how to prepare their international exhibition and most importantly, how to design it conceptually. Uh, the way of working of Carlo Ripa di Meana and Vittorio Gregotti was a method through project projects, different projects like project management. So they have the project of the Mulino Stacchi, the project of the Biennale dedicated to Freedom in Chile, the project of the renovation of the um, Salonia Le Zattere, and they decided that the, um, the best way to address the problem of the national participations was that of uh, deciding a theme, uh, a single topic for everyone, for the institution and for the different national participations as well. This was a not, uh, not a, um, a new idea. The, um, the problem of, of the solution of a thematic exhibition was something that was discussed uh, already um, at the end of the 1960, it was something that uh, even Lawrence always was thinking about. It was so something that was put forward during the debates and during the protests uh, in Venice in 1968. And it was something that was tried in the two editions of the Biennale during all the process of a reform, the edition of the 1970 and 1972, there was already uh, a tentative theme. But um, the reform the Biennale decided that this theme was to be discussed together with all the nations that had a pavilion in Venice, and they started to organize international meetings with all the different repre representatives of the nations and of the pavilions. So these are two posters like announcing these meetings. And, and these meetings were all recorded and all documented and summarized in the yearbooks. So you again have uh, a, very, um, a very thoughtful uh, way of using information that was recorded at Unfortunately, now you cannot assess this kind of uh, sound material, but you have luckily the, the yearbooks and the transcriptions uh, in the archives of the Biennale. And the, the theme, the topic for the um, edition of international exhibition, of course, uh, because this way of organizing events in Venice 
was very much uh, contested by uh, the artists, the professionals, the, the, represent the, institu the national institutions owning a pavilion because the pavilion remained closed from 1972 to 1976, a lot of years. So they, they were in a very bad situation, like this one. This is an, an article that um, it's against the, the new way of organizing events of a Biennale and it shows as a first thing an image of an empty pavilion with all the dust and all ruined and so they were asking repeatedly to open the pavilions and to organize the exhibition again and sorry and in these meetings, the, um, the first team uh, topic that came out was that of um, the physical environment. W was the first topic that was announced. That then became um, a theme for everything, um, meaning the institutional exhibitions mounted and organized by the Biennale and the other pavilions. It is said that it was Punto Sultan to suggest this theme of the environment and it, this theme was declined in, by Grigot in two different ways. One about the f mm, a kind of phenomenological concept of environment and one like more s sociological concept of environment like um, uh, art and society, art and its audience, art and participation. Participation was another important um, theme for this Biennale that was seeking to expand its, expand its audience and also organizing um, spectacles and workshops in the industrial buildings of Marghera with the workers as audience. And also there, it was kind of contested reception of this initiative. At they, they perceived it like a top-down initiative and not a bottom-up one. So the pavilions opened again in 1976. And what I would like to talk about now is the, um, um, the central pavilion and the institutional uh, exhibition that took place there. I think that this is, this is important to uh, understand the, the perspective of the institution uh, and to understand uh, how the institution was speaking about itself during the first uh, edition of the international art exhibition of this for um, of these years of the 1970s in the main pavilion you had three exhibition one was spagna avanguardia artistica realtà sociale spain artistic avant-garde and social contest that was not organized by the official institution managing the Spanish pavilion. The Spanish pavilion was closed and this exhibition was, um, was uh, not so far from the, the death of Francisco Franco, so it was a very delicate moment in the history of the relations between Italy and, and Spain and the National Pavilion remained closed and this exhibition was uh, organized by um, a team of uh, Spanish artists and intellectuals that were uh, exiled in France and that decided to um, organize this exhibition uh, like a survey of all the 
uh, artworks and artists who were working under uh, the Franco regime and also how the, the concept of modern and contemporary art and its uh, presentational power was in a kind um, used by the, the regime to construct uh, an image of modernity. So it had like posters and a fountain by, Cal by Alexander Calder, but I have no many images of this and <laughs> I'm not going very deep into this exhibition because I didn't have the chance to study it, but I, I know it's, it's, uh, it's going to be studied and that it's very imp important for Spanish scholars. And beside, because the, the, the pavilion had all the rooms next to, next to each other, so was it, the main pavilion was divided between the, um, this exhibition and the exhibition organized, curated by Germano Cela, you, Germano Cela. And you can say that this was the uh, beside um, the Bachelor Machines by Harald Zeman in 1975, you can say that this is actually a, a curated exhibition because it has a, had a really precise purpose and a really precise idea of how to use the spaces of a pavilion and how to interact with the history of the pavilion. What Celan did was a survey of the, um, the creation of environments in contemporary art. And he decided to recreate some historical environments like this of Piet Mondrian. So you had this kind of cubes at the center of the rooms in the pavilions you could enter and look at uh, and be inside the environment by Mondrian or you have the one by Arman or even by Duchamp. So these are all reproductions of historical environments and were made with, uh, outside they were a white cube with a glossy material and instead all the, you can also see here, all the walls of the pavilion were deprived of all its decorative layers. So you had just the bricks and white paint. And in the rooms with the reproduction of the historical environment, you had the pictures, the archival pictures of the original environment by the artist and then you can enter the reproduction. Instead, he asked contemporary artists to, um, to occupy some rooms of the pavilion and to realize their own environments being there, like commissions. And this is, in a way, it's a historical survey because you have a very important art historical archival research and reproduction research. You have a very precise curatorial statement about the space, about the selection of artists, and you have also a very precise curatorial statement about how to work with contemporary artists. And this is a, it's completely different from the other exhibition, the other political exhibition. This exhibition didn't have a political statement. This one was a survey with a retrospective eye on art and politics. The third exhibition is the less known one. And it was in the more hidden part of the pavilion. Now uh, it hosts the, the library and the auditorium of the Biennale. 
And this was supposed to be the Italian participation to uh, the Venice Biennial of 1976. It was organized by different curators, at first by Raffaele De Grada, that was an um, art historian and art critic from Milan, and he was very uh, close to uh, the Communist Party. But then, in the end, it was factually organized by Enrico Crispolti, who was a younger art critic than the Grada, and that was based in Rome. And he was, uh, from some years, working on and with um, artistic projects in the public space. And they decided that the Ita Italian section should be an uh, experimental one, addressing all the contemporary researches of artists and um, animatori or uh, facilitators in uh, the suburbs of Italy, in the, of, uh, of the towns in Italy, uh, in the countryside, and with different uh, projects that could be uh, about education, about architecture, about urbanism. Um, and it was a mix of materials coming from artists from all Italy, from really from the area of Naples to Turin. And all these materials was uh, combined in an itinerary which uh, was uh, designed and something that uh, could inform, uh, sorry, that could give information to the viewer about these uh, experimental researches, artistic researches in the public space and with um, the communities of the neighborhoods in, uh, in the cities. So there, was n there, mm, there were not artworks, but uh, just archival materials sent by the artists themselves, pictures, uh, films, uh, Xerox fanzine, and at the beginning of the itinerary there was this um, projection with a technique of multivision that was very popular in those years, that meaning uh, that projecting pictures uh, one next to the other to, um, to make an all-around uh, projection, uh, all-around the viewer, that's so, why uh, you have an Im immersive uh, room, and this multivision was contest uh, contested by the artists because in a way it was a spectacularization of their own archival material. And then you have videotapes, and most importantly, you have um, a common room, an auditorium, because the, one of the purposes of this exhibition was to bring these different people, these different groups of artists uh, working in the urban space and with uh, emarginated communities at the Biennale to discuss and create a platform for exchange that not always uh, was a success, of course. Uh, for example, this is an exhibition and a series of uh, meetings organized by Comitato di Quartiere Garibaldi, this um, association of uh, people who were living in a neighborhood in the city center of Milan and at the time the city center of the cities were poor neighborhoods before the gentrification process and the gentrification pro process was starting in those years and this association was protesting against the politics of um, the city of Milan and it was trying to uh, collect materials about the history of the neighborhoods and all, all the people living there. And so, and of, of course, organize actions against this process of expelling people at the outskirts of the city. 
and they were organized their own exhibition in this space, inside this section of the Venice Biennale. Again, another thing that is very particular of the Biennale of the 1970s is that it um, was trying to um, initiate a process of uh, decentralization, which means that to bring its cultural activities in the mainland, in different cities, and to uh, collaborate with schools, with theaters, with libraries in the different towns of Italy. And there were many meetings and debates about this concept of uh, a structure of the institution that was not ce centralized in Venice, but had different workshop, workshops outside of a city. Um, and this, is a very, uh, po this was a very popular um, concept and purpose in Italy in those years because um, it started with the creation of the regional administrations in 19, yes, in 1970. Um, and that is why the Biennale had a specific uh, office for this kind of, um, of activities. Um, I hope I try, I tried to <laughs> explain how better I could the, um, this, the very complex structure of these events in the 1970s, one that I'm not speaking about, that I think it's very important to study uh, now, and it is not studied yet, it's the, fine, uh, it's the, um, it's the addition of, uh, not the addition, but the events taking place in, and organized by the Biennale in, the in 1977, that were dedicated to um, the art um, of dissent in the, to the dissent in the um, uh, countries of the um, of uh, uh, Eastern Europe. Um, of course, dissent against the um, against Russia, and that was a very contested year and series of events that is has not been studied yet. Uh, and also the last um, Biennale uh, of this four-year program, that's the Biennale of 1978, that was dedicated to nature. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I cannot go uh, deeply in this too because they were not the, the subject of my research and they're not as I said, they're not studied yet, like, uh, deeply. Um, what I was trying to, uh, to highlight for you with this very fast uh, survey of those years, that in my view, these were the last modern biennials um, of the history of the Venice Biennial because they had um, a very specific uh, progressive plan, that of building a democratic, ethical, cultural institution that to bring forward um, something better to, in a teleological progressive view, and not just the repetition of the same format. Of course, this uh, program was utopistic in a way, and it failed, of course. But I really do consider the, um, the, the four years plan of the, of the Biennale in, 19, in the 1970s as um, the last modern endeavor of a cultural institution. And then what happened next, it's completely different. 
And I think it is very important to highlight those years, and I'm sorry I couldn't like bring to you more research because you have like a lot of materials, a lot of the documents, and, and a lot of different activities. Um, and to highlight this in order, as I said, to um, to look for moments of discontinuity in what, in the general debate, is perceived as a figure of speech, the Biennale, as something that we use very easily, but hopefully historical research and historical research made by team of researchers, also internationally, can help us like reconstructing all these connections and all these moments. And I'm, I'm sorry for <laughs> speaking too much and uh, if there are any questions I can answer or maybe we can leave the word and um, to Anita, I don't know. What would you like to do? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we are a little bit running out of time, but uh, thank you for this wonderful <laughs> and extremely rich uh, and um, and nuanced uh, talk, and uh, we can. I think we can still we can take one or two questions now, um, quickly, and then we can uh, have uh, more questions at the end. So, if they are as you wish, as you. Well, really? it's always good to take questions right away. Okay. It's <laughs> the best thing. So, um, are there questions? Curiosities. I, I was just wondering a very technical, very small thing about these uh, yearbooks you mentioned and yes. this idea of, uh, you know... Uh, um, Documenting everything. Yeah, it, it just, it's just something so um, it's, uh, amazing and it's also something internationally that happens also in France in, well, in, on a very smaller scale, but in the, in the 70s I never thought of that in the catalogues of the uh, Parisian Biennale, you find Georges Boudai, instead of writing introductions, he would publish the notes of the meetings in the between, you know, all these uh, things. And I was always wondering why he would do that, and this gives a context. But my question is just, were these yearbooks published? Were they public? Were they... Uh, yes, yeah, they did. How, they're many, they're how many, how many, quel tirage, how many copies, or were they I think sold? There are, were I they think there are... There are, uh, yes, they were sold uh, or being consulted into, uh, because uh, I forgot to, to say that the Biennale opened its archives and the public library. So Cacornel de la Regina was a public library with all the books collected by the Biennale in years and all the archival materials, including also all the movies from the cinema festival, all the, docu the visual that documentation. That was in hmm? 1970? That was in the 70s? Yes, yes, it was, the Cagornar was opened in 19, this is the poster, the inauguration, 17 July of 1976. So this was a public library, and the yearbooks were the, the book format of this public library, like documenting everything, and I think you, you can find them online like very easily and I think they publish them in a lot of copies. Okay, uh, thank you. I just have two questions. Um, one is about the disintegration of the Bayeno, um, mm -hmm. which you talk about. Um, so where, um, Est-ce qu'il y avait, euh, ouais, je, je peux parler en français. Est-ce qu'il y avait un décentrement aussi euh, sociologique par rapport aux participants à la Biennale Est-ce qu'il y avait plus des femmes Est-ce qu'il y avait plus d'artistes du sud d'Italie Est-ce que, est-ce qu'il y avait eu un changement aussi euh, dans, dans les artistes qui pouvaient y participer That's a very interesting question because uh, that was uh, that was. Um, that's why the, this concept put forward by the Biennale of decentralization was, was contested, because it was a kind of political uh, rhetoric. Uh, they were organizing 
activities in the towns, but they were all um, top-down initiatives, like from the Biennale to the students, to the movements, uh, to the citizens of the neighborhoods. But this thing of the representation, for example, of women or other artists in the Biennale, it was not uh, faced. Um, also, during the, 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 the discussion, it was not a topic uh, inside the institution, apart from some singular activities. There was um, a workshop in 1974 organized by Dacia Maraini in the islands of, in the different islands and neighborhoods of Venice with the groups of women. And uh, ironically, this activity was uh, contested by the magazines uh, and the, the newspapers uh, because it was um, a kind of a feminist initiative inside the, the Biennale. But as I remember, it was just one of a few. So yeah, it, it's a good question that the concept of decentralization was an institutional and a, a rhetoric one and not something that came from the movements. It was a bit an appropriation. I have uh, another question, which is, um, could you come back uh, on the, um, the, the, the changement of the biennial ethos from, from the democratic rhetoric of the 1948 to the solidarity ethos of the 70s? Yes, of course. This one? Oh, yes, you, you talk about um, a changement in the, in the ethos, like uh, the, uh, the internationality of the biennials were more focused on this idea of solidarity. Yes, this is, this is the f um, something I'm, I'm reflecting about. I think that this uh, ethos of solidarity was a missed opportunity by the biennial because it happened just for that year and it not happened again. And that it was actually a very interesting way of addressing the problem of internationality instead of like, uh, I don't know, half of the artists from this country, half women uh, percentage, or instead like appropriation of um, other concepts, other uh, ideas brought forward by the movements. Um, it was something that could provide, solid solidarity was something that could provide a shared, a shared platform to discuss about what internationality in culture, in, in the cultural institution actually is. But it was a missed chance, I think. Thank but you. You're welcome. Thank you. Wait, uh, do you know why uh, the, um, this first topic, the physical environment, was chosen? Uh, I think that it was, it, it was not a new topic because uh, artists, of course, the, the Biennale uh, comes up with ideas late with respect to artistic research. So all the artists working on the, the, the environment, you have the, all the, the minimalists and, and then the la land art. But all these things were known in Italy at the end of the 1960s with the exhibition by Celland. So 1976, it's a late year for this kind of approach. But I think it was also um, related to the um, environmentalist movement to ecology. So it was, that was a very hot topic, hot topic at the time. And so I think it was um, a very diplomatic choice. Something specific but broad at the same time 
to bring together all the national participations and the shows organized by institutions. Yes, it's a diplomatic move. You're welcome. Um, well, thank you. And we can come back with questions after Anita's talk, but I'm just <laughs> looking at the watch. And so uh, we'll uh, hear Anita Orses um, about uh, the second part of the topic of today, which is the Latin American biennials and with a connection to Venice again. Yes? First of uh, all, I would like to thank the organizer of this seminar for uh, organizing it and uh, inviting me to participate. And uh, I would uh, also like to, thank, to extend my thanks to Elitza for being so patient with me and uh, answering all my, my questions. This lecture will be divided into three parts. The first part will briefly analyze the, how the biennial phenomenon has been uh, studied at the, until now. Better? Okay. This lecture will be divided into three parts. The first part will uh, briefly analyze how the biennial phenomenon has been studied until now and what role the Havana Biennial plays. I will offer uh, an excursus on biennial and counter-biennial in Latin America between 1951 and 1984, that is, between the first edition of Sao Paulo Biennial and the first uh, Havana. The second part will be devoted to analyze the first three editions of Havana Biennial and its organizational strategy, strategy. Uh, emphasis, emphasis on, uh, um, sorry, um, em, uh, emphasis will be placed on these three editions because they define little by little the current model which has been readapted by many others. The third part will analyze the, the often criticized division into national pavilion of the Venice Biennial and the participation of Latin American countries with a national pavilion. So let's start with part one. When we speak about biennial phenomenon, keep this figure in mind. More than 100 biennials are now held around the world every year. This proliferation seems to know no limits nowadays as the term biennial has been used indiscriminately without a clear definition being offered. There are many types of biennial and what complicates the analysis even more is their geographical distribution, their global and local aspiration and their history. In fact, each new biennial is inspired by existing model, but a new biennial site rethinks this format in relation to the particularity or distinctive aspect of the place. Likewise, when we face more historical biennial, we have to take into account both the motive of their foundation, their history, and the point at which they are now. We can be diametrically opposite from the starting point. Many biennials have similar aspects and roots in common, but took different paths throughout their history. In 2009, in Bergen, the conference to biennial or not to biennial took place. On this occasion, Caroline Jones pointed out that the area of the history of a biennial may have only just begun, but problems concerning their method were already arising. In fact, the need and will on deal with this complexity led critics, curators, and historians to create typologies and categories as varied as the almost incalculable number of biennials existing today. These categorizations are based on origin, uh, on origins, their purpose, geographical position, and funding sources. From my point of view, this approach can be correct if taken as starting point, but reductive if one does not consider the hybrid origins of some biennials 
and their trajectories. That is, uh, as some biennial throughout their history could move from a category to another. I also consider it's important to analyze the exchanges between the two sides of Pacific and Atlantic. These exchanges can be north to north, south to south, north to south, or south to north. To explain what I mean, I want to call our attention to the thesis of Rafael Nemoyeski and Charles Green and Anthony Garden. In the case of the first one, I refer to the thesis posited in the essay Venice or Havana, a polemic genesis of contemporary art biennial. Here, Nemoyevsky, instead of facing the biennial phenomenon with classification, establishes a before and an after within the history of biennial, reevaluating the relevance of the Venice biennial as the main point of reference for biennial and providing a definition of a contemporary biennial whose reference model is the Havana. According to this definition, the contemporary biennial is a large-scale international panoramic exhibition of contemporary art that is held at regular intervals, but not necessarily biennially. It has a strong desire to negotiate its peripheral condition, to represent the ambition of the host city, and to create infrastructure for contemporary art and public sphere. In this before and after analysis, he identifies the many pre-globalized pre 20th century biennial, the Carnegie, San Paolo, and Documenta, and identify them as the most important evolutionary change uh, of the Havana uh, model. However, none provide a true program of action for the genesis of the contemporary biennial, which take place in the mid-1980s and uh, is responsible for the proliferation of the format, which is applied quickly in place uh, that had uh, traditionally been marginalized, Istanbul, Johannesburg, Dakar, and later recovered by the second tier city in Europe, Lyon, Lyon Triana, Seville, and the Far East. This crucial moment <coughs> in the history of the contemporary biennial occurs uh, in 1984, when the first edition of Havana Biennial is celebrated and, establish, and established as the first recurring exhibition in the Third World. On the other hand, Charles Green and Anthony Garden argue that the Havana Biennial is not the origin, but rather the culmination of an extraordinary and overlooked history of international exhibition in the Global South. Then they begin to deconstruct the official, vertical, and eurocentric history of a biennial, replacing this eclipsed biennial on the biennial map. Thanks to this, we can see that the biennial phenomenon, if we understand it as the proliferation of biennials, begin in 1951 and not in 1984. They also point out that this biennial, our regionalistic biennial, this means South-South dialogue, and that they reach the exhibition with an assortment of parallel events. They suggest that another perspective of the biennials and their histories emerge if we approach the subject of the biennials in a different way. To be more specific, the lineage of the biennials shifts when it's observed from the perpetually insistent demand of the North, but rather from the viewpoint and aspiration of the South. A question like, what might a Southern perspective look like is surely a very attractive question to posit, so much so that allowed me to try to fill in the gaps in the official history of the biennial, focusing my attention on Latin America and the Caribbean, and this is the scenario that I was able to reconstruct. So, on the, on the left, the Charles Green and Garden, Garden, uh, the Garden and Green map, and on the right, my, my map. There are a lot of, of biennial. The biennialistic reality in Latin America and the Caribbean before the Havana Biennial is very heterogeneous. Some are international biennials, others are regionalist, that is, with a particular focus on nearby geographical area. That are manifestations that reach the exhibition with parallel events. 
Some have not surpassed their first three or four editions, and others still exist. For example, the biennial of engraving on San Juan in Puerto Rico, that seen in 2004, is a triennial. And others are trying to resume. For example, the Colta Car Biennial in, uh, in Colombia with the International Encounter of Medellin in 2007 and 2015. We are faced then with uh, a broad, heterogeneous, and complex scenario. On this occasion, I want to briefly analyze the three biennial, Cordoba Biennial, Coltejar Biennial, and the first Latin American Biennial of Sao Paulo, and the first Latin American Biennial of Sao Paulo, to highlight how, despite the regionalist nature of some biennials, they continue to suffer the hegemony of the North, both in terms of economic sources and in terms of format, curatorial criteria, and taste. For example, who the curators and the member of the jury are. The Havana Biennial is, this is the first point. The second point, the Havana Biennial is not the first biennial in Latin America counter the global order established by the Venice Biennial. Despite it, the, the Havana Biennial is remembered as a brick through and occupy a, permanent, a prominent place in the biennial history in the global side, south. In addition, the reflective component of, La of Latin American Biennial involves uh, the displacement of curator and art critic and create a network. This network will also be reflected in the Havana Biennial. Regarding the first point, I would like to mention the Cordoba Biennial and the Coltejer Biennial. The Cordoba Biennial is due to the initiative of a group of a local artists and the cultural policy of the United States during the Cold War. On the one hand, the artists of Cordoba wanted a space for exhibiting local, regional, and neighboring countries' art. On the other hand, the official cultural policy of the United States was in favor of inter-Americanism, that is, the cultural exchange between United States and Latin America, in order to carry out an ideological battle in a symbolic field such as art. In fact, once the Cordoba Biennial was over, some works were selected and a tour to Buenos Aires and several cities in the United States was organized. The Cordoba is sponsored by Kaiser Industry, a company we share in Argentina, but whose capital is mainly North American. The three editions of Cordoba Biennial are regionalistic and competitive in nature. As you can see in the image, the number of participating countries increases throughout the three editions. That the event was open to practically the entire American continent is justified by the fact that the American part of the company claimed a more active participation in the events, and not only economic, as it can be up to that time. Uh, with respect to this competitive character, uh, the Cordoba Biennial follows the Venetian model with a jury and uh, award. In addition to, to this, in the second edition, Umbra Polonio from Venice Biennial was appointed as president of the jury. Also, in the case of the third edition, it will be a Western jury that will be awarding the prizes. On this occasion, the member of the jury will be Arnold Bod, founder of Documenta, Alfred Barr of the MoMA, and Sam, Sam Hunter from New York. A similar reality is found in the Coltejer Biennial. The first edition is characterized by its regionalistic approach, so much so that it is called the first Ibero-American painting biennial. The second edition, on the, on, the, on the one end, is completed by a series of parallel events mainly seminars, and on the other, abandons a regionalistic approach in favor of an international one. I use the second edition as an example, although, uh, oh, okay, uh, I, I, I speak uh, briefly about the second edition. In the second edition, the election of the curators demonstrated the hegemony of the North 
I use uh, this addiction as an example, although this situation could uh, also arise uh, in the third addiction. The curator in the case of the second edition are Vicente Aguilera uh, Cerny from Spain, Lawrence Holloway from the United States, and Giulio Carlo Argan from Italy. I want to emphasize that uh, if in 1970, Lawrence Holloway is part of the curatorial team of the Coltacher Biennial, two years before he published the book The Venice Biennial, 1895-1968. Vicente Aguilera Cerny wins the first international prize for criticism awarded by the Venice Biennial in 1959, and Giulio Carlo Argan's relation, relationship with Venice is content as a result of his position as Italian critic and historian. Regarding the second point, that is uh, biennial counter the global uh, order established uh, by the um, Venice Biennial, we must remember the Havana Bi Biennial without forgetting the first Latin American Biennial of Sao Paulo. Before stopping at the first Latin America Biennial of Sao Paulo in 1978, uh, we must emphasize the opposition between the Sao Paulo Biennial, the international, not the Latin American, and Havana. The Sao Paulo Biennial has been created with the idea of transmitting an idea of progress using the iconography and innovation of the Western art artist avant-garde, and thus distancing Brazil from the other Latin American countries. The purpose of Havana Biennial was exact the opposite. Cuba wanted to build an international platform alternative to the Grand Tour Biennial, exhibiting only artists of what was one, once called the third world and presenting themselves not only as an exhibition but as a constellation of, 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 of events. Despite uh, its geographically no Western position, the goals of Sao Paulo Biennial were Western, as it was a biennial of the Grand Tour. It represented a springboard for Latin American artists toward Europe and the United States. In uh, its first two decades of existence, it was an international stage. It was uh, not an event to study the artistic production of Latin America, at the time still unknown, nor a meeting place for artists who ignore the artistic practices of neighboring countries. What was done in Argentina, Chile, or Uruguay was unknown. Uh, as a, um, an answer to the need for uh, critics and historians to know what was happening in Latin America, the first Latin America Biennial of Sao Paulo was organized. It took place in 1978. It was a biennial exclusively dedicated to Latin American artists, accompanied by a symposium whose goal were to study the specificity of a Latin American art and to analyze the particular conditions and an artistic production in each country from Latin America. The biennial was reflective, was discursive. That is, it invited artists to work on the central theme of the exhibition, Myth and Magic, which wanted to make reference to the pre-Columbian and black African legacy in the artistic manifestation of the time. The first edition was followed by a meeting in 1981 in which critics from Brazil and several countries of Latin America participated, voting for or against the continuity of Latin America Biennial of Sao Paulo. After three days of debate, the follow following options were put to vote. In favor of a Latin America Biennial has the unique event in Sao Paulo, nine votes in favor of an international biennial with emphasis on Latin American art, 23 votes, in favor of alternate biennials, one Latin America and one international, one vote. This, the reason the second option won were several. Firstly, there were those who said that they could not afford to participate in two biennials. 
in the case of a Latin America biennial, all the expenses were covered by the invited countries. And secondly, others expressed that organized a biennial of Latin American art was, in essence, ghettoizing its production. Finally, there were those who had international aspirations and wanted to, um, wanted to publicize the production of artists from their country worldwide. And so, in Sao Paulo, the only possibility for this. The first Latin America biennial of, uh, of Sao Paulo was a, a failed first attempt, but uh, its promoters and supporters did not give up, and we find them some years later in the theoretical events of the Havana Biennial. On this occasion, I will be talking about the first three editions because it is in this that the identity, identity of the Caribbean Biennial and its new way of doing and making art in a biennial is defined. I cannot conclude this section without remembering the, ar the article by the Peruvian Juan Acha, entitled The Biennials in Latin America Today, written after the meeting in, 18, in 1981 in Sao Paulo. Juan Acha indicates that the awareness biennial model is not adapted to Latin America and advocates as a counterpart specialized biennials whether dedicated to a technique or to a cultural, cultural and geographic area, for example, Ibero-America or Latin America. Acha believes that the real solution is in the research biennial and without prices, where one or several critics work with a theme or an idea and choose the corresponding artworks. He considers this formula the most effective way to get to know the artistic production of Latin America. Since, as was pointed out in the first Latin America biennial of Sao Paulo, the artistic production of a nearby country was unknown. This consideration will uh, lend him to organize the Latin America Colloquium of No Objectual Art in Medellin, Colombia. With uh, respect to the first uh, reflections on uh, the Havana Biennial, they take place uh, during the funeral of Wilfredo Lam in Cuba. Lam Guido, Fidel Castro, and some official from the Ministry of Culture reflects about the creating a permanent center dedicated to Lam and, in parallel, an international event dedicated to visual art and where to exhibit art of Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia. Finally, the format of Art Biennial was chosen, a model that was known thanks to Venice Biennial, a biennial in which Cuba had participated in some occasion, 1952, 1966, 1972, and that of Sao Paulo, despite the fact that uh, there had been no contact with Brazil for a uh, for year. In addition, the other biennials or attempts at biennials that we have just seen in Latin America were unknown on the Caribbean island. Documenta was known either. In that period, Cuba was uh, isolated. It had not contact with most of the wellness country. Latin America and the Caribbean were areas of conflict. With the exception of Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, and Peru, since Cuba was being expelled from the Organization of Latin American States, there were no diplomatic relations with the other country of the continent. The only significant presence of Cuba in the international context was uh, with the movement of non aligned countries, constituted exclusively by nations in the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. In summary, Cuba wanted to organize a biennial in which to exhibit the art of Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia, but it was isolated. It wanted to and had to establish or re-establish contacts with the Latin American regions and in general, its artistic production was unknown. 
And here again, we find an absence also identified by the first Latin America biennial of Sao Paulo. It's aspired to ex know and exhibit, exhibit African and Asian art from countries with which it maintains some collaboration in the educational sphere, but the information related to local art was a blank slate. Considering that the challenge is great, time is short, and economic resources are lim limited, the organization team of Havana Biennial decided to limit the first edition to Latin America and the Caribbean. This edition is important for a few reasons. The selection, the collateral events, and the competitive nature. The first one is that there isn't a selection of artists or artworks. The organization team redact the call with the participation modalities. Art artists from Latin America and Caribbean living or not in their native country, or foreign artists who have been living there for five years can participate. And also the organization team promise to exhibit all the received artwork. The first challenge is to get the word out, mainly through unofficial cha uh, channels. The artworks begin to arrive, most of them clandestinely, from Latin America to Europe, mainly Madrid, from Europe to Cuba. Regarding the structure of the first edition, it's important to highlight two aspects. The first one is that many collateral events had already been organized, seminars, but also workshop with artists and the public and between artists, which will later be, be the characteristic element of the Havana Biennial. The second one is that Havana Biennial adopts the competitive format characteristic of Venice, that is, with a jury and a ward. It could seem that Havana is not so different from Cordoba or Coltejer Biennial. However, I think that in this case, it's important to consider who the member of the jury are. Uh, if we compare the jury of this biennial, we can see that in the Havana, there is an hegemonic, a North hegemonic criteria. criteria. In addition, it's important to underline that the jury decided to increase the number of the prizes from five to 33, and for a first sign that from the beginning, the traditional competitive model used at the international level was not considered appropriate. After the first edition, which has been uh, carried out in a hurry and without a well-defined project, a director is named. Lila Yanes, the new director with the new curatorial team, start to work actively to open the biennial to Africa, Asia, and Middle East, and to transform the center Wilfredo Lam from idea on a paper to a reality. Yanes also reflects a lot about the appropriate format for the Havana Biennial. In the book, Memories, Havana Biennial, Yanes indicates that the division into national pavilion of Venice Biennial was, I quote, suitable for rich countries, so much so that for years it had not offered a global vision of art, since it keep at the margins of the contemporaneity those who were not economically equal. equal, equal. She understands that organizational formula and structure of the Havana Biennial had to be in line with the foundational purpose of the Wilfredo Lam Center. It also, it has to create a center of alternative interest and antagonistic to existing one. The second biennial uh, in uh, 1986 uh, is formed as a constellation of events with a clear research approach and uh, horizontal dialogue. I will be explaining it by illustrating the exhibition and events organized. The first one is the exhibition competition. Uh, 
these are a lot of images, I mean four images of the second biennial. And on the right, the structure of the second biennial of Havana. Uh, so the, um, uh, the structure of the second Havana biennial is uh, exhibition competition, a main ob uh, exhibition. Here there are artists from uh, all the invited countries. The purpose is offer a panoramic view of contemporary art in the third world. It is important to underline then whether to, ac to exhibit the works by countries or by technique is considered. It's decided to exhibit by the countries because it's considered a good way to understand what is produced in its throne. This is important because even, even um, this is important because even if there are in pavilions like in Venice, the national component is present and considered important at the beginning. Honorary exhibition. Honorary exhibition are, uh, are um, personal and uh, collective exhibition through which the curatorial team want to give visibility to some relevant aspect of the participating countries which uh, hadn't been explained so well in the main exhibition, I mean the uh, exhibition competition. Honorary exhibition are independent unit disseminated in the old Havana. Then uh, Cuban art exhibition, the purpose was to fill the gaps in what was exhibited in National Museum since the collection had an ex excellent historical panorama of national art but was lacking in terms of new generations of artists. Then workshops and meetings with artists, they are very important since they favor exchange between artists and various countries and contribute to develop and the enrichment of Cuban, um, Cuban artists. Some are uh, held in public spaces and uh, the public can participate. This is, this is an important point because the public is part of the exhibition and not just someone who visits the exhibition. The theoretical events, they aim to enrich the conceptual character of the events and generate a reflection that can be resumed in other places. In this case, the purpose is the creation of a cultural network and artistic community. Um, even if this, the, even, even if uh, this edition continues to have a competitive nature, after the inauguration, the jury drafts a document with some advices to eliminate prices and to increase workshop between artists and with the public. It's interesting to note that the final format of the Havana Biennial is starting to define in this second edition and that it corresponds to the biennial format identified as ideal and necessary by Juan Nacha in the context of Latin America and Caribbean. ACHA is also one of the participa participations of the theoretical events during the second edition. As we have already seen in his article, The Biennial in Latin America Today, ACHA advocates the format of the research biennial on an idea or topic specialized in a cultural and geographical area. He refers to Ibero-America or Latin America, while the Havana Biennial appeals to the third world. And Juan Acha advocates also uh, for a biennial without prices. In the third edition, 1989, uh, uh, it is in the third edition that the model of the biennial is defined. The artists are no longer exhibited by nationality, the prices are eliminated, and the space and occasion that favor an horizontal dialogue are multiplied. The prices elimination has been important because it has allowed them to distance themselves from the imposition of the traditional models. At, and in that period, the traditional model is Venice. Also, 
considering that is a space dedicated to dialogue, it does not make sense to compete. The Havana Biennial hopes to think, reflect, and discuss. The best way to do it is to choose a theme for each edition that will be interesting to all the participating countries in order to visualize and listen the various points of view. All the events, all the events, all the events revolve around this theme and the biennial invites the city with institution and houses. In the third edition, the theme is uh, tradition and contemporarity in the art of the third world. The general exhibition at the Museum of Fine Art is designed as an essay through which uh, exhibit uh, an, an issue. This exhibition should offer a general approach as the personal and collective exhibition were a complete complement to the first one emphasizing a, spe uh, a specific aspect that deserves to be explored. So on, on the screen you can see the division of the third Havana Biennial with all the exhibition, uh, the theoretical events, and also the workshop. And here you can, you can find some, some uh, images. The theoretical event become uh, free and the response of the public, mainly students, is very positive. Once the meeting is over, the free grandstand is opened, a space where anyone could propose a debate or teach their artistic production. Due to the identification of Havana as a research biennial and the creation of a network of critics and curators, as well as the movement of these people, he cannot conclude this part without remembering the way in which, since the second edition, the artists are selected. The creatorial team of Havana, uh, the creatorial team of Havana Bayenia knew that their knowledge of artistic production in Asia, Africa, and Middle East was uh, null, and they had to visit this country firsthand because they could not trust the official representation sent by embassy and governments. Because of this, and has the Ministry of Culture not understanding its importance, was not willing the finance to this research trip, they decide to use bilateral agreements, I mean cultural agreements, with the countries of interest. According to these agreements, which had not been used until then, Cuba and other countries had, to chance, had the chance to exchange exhibitions. The curatorial team of the Havana Biennial prepares and offers exhibition to these countries with the condition that the curators travel to the site. In this way, they wanted, on the one hand, to take advantage of this trip to get to know the local art scene and establish contacts with the artist and on the other end to start training expert. After this trip, they organize a meeting, the collected material is, is uh, told, proposals are made and the artists are selected. On the screen, you can see some trips made during the organization of the second edition. These trips are very important because they lead the, to the creation of critical and curatorial networks, a transatlantic circulation of people and idea, which has not yet been studied in deep. I think that uh, it's uh, urgent to, to do so because it could uh, offer uh, it could offer us a new perspective, relationship, and mutual influence between biennial. I'm thinking of Johannesburg, to, to name one. In these scenes, I will advise against studying the biennial phenomenon from a chronological and geological point of view, adding close categories, as 
um, a much richer scenario will be open to us that uh, would allow us to emphasize international and transnational exchange. On the screen, you can see a compilation of the trips made by the team of the Havana Biennial between 1986 and 2007. It includes the international and institutional relationship that were established as a result of this trip. Of the, of this trip. And then with, uh, with the last part, that is about national pavilions in, uh, in Venice. Uh, by and large, the national biennial division into um, pavilion, into national pavilion, uh, is considered obsolete, uh, without uh, of the 19th century, and international critics advocate the need to abandon, modify, or uh, update uh, it. A uh, dissonant voice is that of uh, Caroline Jones, who consider that the pavilion component is a very useful in its uh, political and conceptual role. I share her uh, vision and consider that although the Venice Biennial structure corresponded to a certain ideology model of how nationality were understood at the end of the 19th century, it is and has been a useful tool for, uh, from a geopolitical and economic point of view. We have seen it on many occasions, for example, during the Cold War with the German Democratic Republic Pavilion and the German Federal Republic Pavilion. With the arrival of Israel with its pavilion in 1948 or the closing of the Spanish pavilion in 1967. Today we see it with the Catalonia pavilion, with the presence of South Korea and the absence of Puerto Rico. Using Latin America participation, I want to explain why it's important to deconstruct and reconstruct the history of I Giardini di Castello to better understand, in some cases, the cultural policy, both of country that have national pavilion inside in Giardini, or does which don't, its symbolic power, and, in the other cases, to delineate the first contact between biennial. Before of it, I needed to explain why there are national pavilion in Venice, and how Venice structure works on a global perspective. So the origin of national pavilions go back to the second edition of the biennial, 1897, in which is noted that because of its international nature, Italian artists do not have enough space to exhibit their work in the Palazzo dell'Esposizione, the only exhibition space back then. In 1907, faced with the demand to offer a wide space, the secretary of the Biennial proposed placing the works of foreign artists in national pavilion that could be, that could be uh, built in the Giardini. This strategy allowed the Biennial to offer more space to Italian artists in the Palazzo dell'Esposizione, but also allow the Bayen, eh, but, eh, but also allow to guarantee a constant international participation. There are uh, three main waves of uh, pavilion construction. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, there are three many three many waves of uh, pavilion construction, and uh, by the end of the 1960s. I Giardini was uh, practically saturated. Um, on the screen, you can see the difference between I Giardini in uh, 1909 and in 1995, uh, which is uh, when the last uh, pavilion, the South Korean one, is uh, built. Since uh, this uh, saturation, the proliferation of uh, satellite pavilion invades <coughs> the city. In 2005, Anthony Montadas presented on translation in Giardini in, Spani, in, in the Spanish pavilion. 
In uh, on translation, in Giardini, Muntada transformed the central hall of the Spanish pavilion into a lobby that evokes waiting room and the transcript in the airport. A rectangular module crosses the space and assumes the function of a database. On one side, it collects the photograph, old and contemporary, of the pavilions, of the participating countries, and information about their history. On the other side, there is a list with the name of the countries excluded from that edition. With this project, Muntada transformed the Spanish pavilion into a complex metaphor of what the Venice Biennial is today. Um, hierarchical structure with places historically and, and politically important countries in a privileged position which they preserve without needing to legitimize it. And historical poor countries in a disadvantaged position and in places far from the flu of people who visit the biennial. The analysis of the plans of the last decade of the biennial demonstrates how the mega exhibition take place not only in Giardini di Castello and in the Arsenal, uh, starting in the 18, uh, in fact, uh, all the urban territory of the Venus Lagoon and the surrounding island is involved. So on the screen, you can see the map of Venice Biennial in 2005. That is when Muntadas present the project and the map in 2017. The phenomenon of the of a superabundant satellite pavilion has a cause and a consequence. On one end, the historical model imposed by Venice seems to affirm that uh, who, do, who uh, doesn't have a pavilion in the biennial is not a country, thus transforming itself into a machinery for the legitimization of the national identity. Therefore, all countries that, that do not have a pavilion inside the Giardini, if they want to participate with dignity in the event, uh, will have to place themselves uh, in the available spaces, cultural institute, all palace, or churches, and invest a lot of effort and money in advertising to attract people and above all to inform them of their existence. The aim, um, the, the aim of all these efforts is to demonstrate that they belong to the biennial machinery. In addition, the distribution of the pavilions demonstrate the existence of a, a hierarchy, both the participants, does who have a pavilion inside the Giardini, and does who have it outside, and the countries that do not attend. The, the geopolitical gap between poor, poor and rich countries is reflected in loudspeakers, a sound installation by Santiago Sierra. Those countries with uh, their own pavilion inside the Giardini represent 24% of the world global and generate 83% of global GDP. Thus, that are outside correspond to the 34% of the world population and their contribution to the GDP is 9%. Finally, the countries that do not participate represent 42% of the population and contribute only 8% to the world economy. Observing the map of the Giardini, we can note that there are only three countries of Latin America that have their own pavilion there, Brazil, Venezuela, and Uruguay. Having clarified the origin of the national pavilions and how countries could manage to have their own pavilion in Giardini, I wonder, why do Brazil, Venezuela, and Uruguay have their own pavilion? Why do Argentina, Colombia, or Mexico not have one? How strong is the symbolic power of the national pavilions and their location at the Giardini di Castello? 
has the arsenal become the place where all countries without permanent national pavilion aspire to be since it is the second main nucleus of the Biennium? To answer one of this question mean interpelling the other since has the fact that I'm going to narrate demonstrated the, uh, they are interconnected. In uh, 2050, Mexico, Mexico participate in Venice Biennial with the Possessing Nature, a monumental steel sculpture with a drainage system, an hydraulic system that takes the, wet, the water from the Venice Lagoon to a mirror of water and then returns the water to Lagoon. Possessing Nature is an historical research of these two cities, Mexico and Venice, share origin but not a destination. And uh, it's, um, it also represented the trip that Mexico made to reach their arsenal, uh, one of the main nucleus of the biennial. The structure of the sculpture corresponds to the root, the union of the place, palaces, churches that have been hosted the Mexican Pavilion Science 2007. This project allows us not only to reaffirm the symbolic power of the mine nucleus of the biennial, so great that Mexico wanted to leave a visual testimony to the journey that was made to approach progressively the arsenal, but also the existence of a remembered history and uh, a remembered history and uh, uh, another forgotten. Uh, I mean, there are two history, a remembered history and a forgotten one. In fact, in the catalog of, okay. In fact, in the, catalog, uh, in the catalogs of uh, Mexican pavilions and the Venice Biennial Press, is claim that 2007 is the first year in which Mexico has a national pavilion. Uh, in only one of the Mexican catalog, do we find uh, a blurred reference to, Mexico participa to Mexican participation with a national pavilion in 1950? Visiting the Venice, Venice Biennial Arch Archive is possible to reconstruct the forgotten history. In fact, Mexico participates in four edition, in four edition with a national pavilion, that is uh, 1952, 1958, 1968, and 1986. In the first uh, three editions, it is inside Giardini, and in the last one uh, at the, the Arsenal. In all these cases, cases, it was able to enjoy a leading position. Well, uh, I only think that uh, archives are uh, magical places where it's possible to read uh, the correspondence and discover the difference between uh, how things are and how they could have been. I'm uh, referring uh, to the correspondence between uh, Rodolfo Pallucchi, biennial secretary, and Fernando Gamboa, creator of Mexican participation. The correspondence reveals then, uh, reveals then between uh, 1948 and 1951, the Venice Biennial offered Mexico the chance to build its own pavilion. At first, uh, near the Danish pavilion, that is the uh, yellow point. Uh, so at first near the Danish pavilion and later, since Mexico did not answer, the land was given to Switzerland. Then Venice offered Mexico a plot between the um, a plot near the United States Pavilion, that is the point, the green, uh, the green point. Um, the refusal of Mexican government arrives in December of uh, 1951. Uh, Fernando Gamboa indicates that the Mexican government decided to invest its entire aviable budget for the promotion of fine arts abroad in, an ex uh, in a Mexican art exhibition in Paris. This decision will lead Mexico not to build its pavilion, 
and also not to participate in the edition of 1954 and 1956, despite the invitation of the biennial due to its lack of economy resources. Finally, it will be participate again intermediate, in, um, it will be participate again um, intermittently from uh, 1958 and 1986 in the space offered by, by Biennial. If Mexico finally decide to not build its pavilion, Venezuela, Brazil, and Uruguay did. I would like to focus on the Brazil pavilion because uh, its case allow the reconstruction of uh, the initial contacts between uh, two historical biennials, Venice and Sao Paulo. At the end of 1947, Matarazzo from the um, Museum of Modern Art of Sao Paulo contacts <laughs> Rodolfo Pallucchi, the Venice secretary, offering, the organi offering to organize the Brazilian participation. Pallucchi's response is enthusiastic and inform him that in order for participation to be official, the biennial has to officially invite the government of the country. Since there is not much time available, he advised Matarazzo to contact the Brazilian government directly. Finally, the negotiation with the government don't go well and Brazil doesn't participate in 1948. The Venice Biennial postpones the Brazilian participation to the next uh, edition and establish that it will be the Museum of Modern Art of Sao Paulo under the direction of Matarazzo, which will take care of the Brazilian participation and mediate with the Brazilian uh, government. One year after the first Brazilian participation in Venice, the first Sao Paulo Biennial is inaugurated. Since then, it's frequent to find in the correspondence initial tips reference to respective participation and personal information that demonstrate how strong a strong friendly relationship. In addition, from that moment, this means from 1951 to the present, the Venice Biennial has organized the Italian participation at Sao Paulo Biennial and the Sao Paulo Biennial has organized the Brazilian participation at Venice. Since uh, 1954, reference has been made to the construction of the pavilion at first in uh, 1958. A space was uh, offered between the United States and Czechoslovakia pavilion, uh, that is the yellow point, and between the United States and Czechoslovakia pavilion, uh, the Indian pavilion had to be uh, erected but finally the project uh, not carry, carried out uh, due to economic uh, problem. In the end, Brazil uh, claims uh, a larger space uh, in a location that uh, facilitates the access uh, of the public. Uh, it is offered the plot uh, located in front of the bridge uh, that connect uh, both uh, the si two sides of the canal. The first uh, project presented by Brazil consists uh, of uh, rebuilding uh, of the bridge and connected the bridge with the pavilion which will cross the canal. The canal. Uh, this first project was not uh, accepted. It's important to say that it was not uh, Venice Biennial who accepted or rejected the project, but the Venice City Hall. So this uh, first project was not uh, accepted and uh, in uh, 1964 uh, another one uh, was made uh, corresponding to the current uh, pavilion. This was inaugurated in uh, 1966. Until then, uh, Brazil uh, had always participated with uh, some room uh, in uh, the Palazzo dell'Esposizione and uh, the friendly relations between the two biennial were so good uh, that then, uh, whenever the Museum of Modern Art uh, complained about uh, the limited uh, space guarantee, the Venice Biennial always acceded to its uh, requests. 
If we go back to the second, um, to the second question, that is uh, how strong the symbolic power of the national pavilion is, uh, and uh, how important it is uh, to have a pavilion inside the Giardini, we can refer to an emblematic solution adopted by the Venice Biennial to accommodate all the countries that wanted to participate within a national architecture. The construction of a precarious prefabricated pavilion in the edition of 1982 and 1984. The precarious pavilion would have to be dismantled at the end of the mega exhibition. In uh, 1982, the only, the only space uh, available corresponded to the riverbank of the Rio Sant'Elena, a metal structure of 96 meter long and nine meter wide was built, which had to be partially <coughs> suspended on the water. This operation also corresponded to the desire to rezone the area seen it was a space destined for waste. The biennial offered the project, but the participating countries had to assume the corresponding expenses. However, this project, this project is extremely expensive, and in the next edition, uh, what I mean, I think that, okay, we can see that the, there are a lot of countries from South America, for example, Colombia, Argentina, Peru, and of course, uh, of course Cuba. Uh, so this is the project in uh, 1982, in, um, but it was very, um, very expensive. So um, um, in the next edition, in 1984, it is decided to uh, opt for a more economical uh, prefabricated structure with a new design and uh, a location near to the Spanish pavilion. These are the only two editions in which uh, the temporary pavilions are uh, build, built uh, due to the cost involved in uh, assembling and disassembling them in each uh, edition. However, its existence within the Giardini, inside the Giardini, it's quite emblematic at a time when the biennial was beginning to expand around the city and a part of the arsenal had already been rehabilitated, as in fact part of the architecture biennial in 1918 took place there. With respect to the countries that agree to participate in this precarious pavilion, I would like to highlight the presence of Cuba a country that uh, returned to participate in the biennial in 1982, exactly two years before the first edition of the Havana Biennial. This is an important point because in 1982, the second edition of Aperto takes place, a section dedicated to young artists without attachment to their nationality and whose only interest is to showcase the last trends in art. It is totally independent from the National Pavilion. I mean, Aperto is totally independent from the National Pavilion. Uh, Lila Yanes, the director of the Wilfredo Lama Center, considers that Aperto was the greatest novelty introduced in Venice biennial history since its creation in 1895, and then I quote uh, Yanis, Aperto was, a project, uh, Aperto was a project that questioned the way in which power structures operated in the circuit of international art. It was the first strategic change that occurred in the world by, of biennial, prior to the existence of the one in Havana. And I cannot deny it that influence my way of seeing the future of our exhibition. Once again, we see a connection between biennial. I also want to indicate that the person who created Cuban participation at Venice Biennial in 1982 and in 1984 was Nelson Herrera, was Nelson Herrera Isla, a member of the curatorial team of Havana Biennial since its first edition. 
and uh, who could see the contrast between Aperto and the Giardini with their national pavilions. In this, lect in this lecture, I have tried, on the one hand, to begin deconstructing the biennial's official history, which is more than the history of all biennials, um, is the history of uh, some biennials in particular. I have underlined how, in Latin America, before the Havana Biennial, there were several attempts to implement the biennial format. The cases analyzed demonstrated how the format chosen is the research one, theorized and supported by Juan Acha. However, despite this format, some biennials, for example, Coldejer Biennial or Cordoba Biennial, remained under the hegemony of the North. Uh, thinking about uh, jury, curator, and economic resources. An example of counter biennial before Havana is the first Latin America biennial of Sao Paulo, but it succumbs to the pressure of an international biennial format. On the other end, a panoramic view of the first three editions of the Havana biennial show how it adopts the format that allows it to be identified as the mother of the peripheral biennial after years of reflection and experimentation. With respect to the structure of the Venice Biennial, I have tried to lay out some example to demonstrate that national pavilions have a very strong symbolic component and also that studying national participation can lead us to establish relationship between biennial, as important as the curatorial network in terms of circulation of ideas and exhibition formats. I therefore consider that since the biennial phenomenon is a global one, we must begin to study it uh, such as, that is, in terms of global exchange and not circumscribing the research to a specific biennial or study areas without taking into account the transnational, transatlantic, and transpacific exchange. Thank you very much, and thank you for your conclusion about uh, studying biennials uh, in connection. It's uh, really interesting to, for me, it was really interesting that uh, you were uh, trying to write a history of art through biennials, artistic exchanges from a biennial to a biennial. So it's, it's um, yeah, it goes beyond um, um, established ideas of autonomy or um, yeah, it's a challenging uh, way of um, of um, thinking about um, our recent history, um, both uh, the case study of the relation between Sao Paulo and Venice, and before that when you were uh, explaining how the selections were made uh, from biennial to biennial, bypassing other kinds of uh, structures or uh, actors, so it's an interesting point. Um, and uh, also I was very interested in the artworks that you showed and uh, how artists reflect on these uh, topics. Uh, and there was just a small, really small, very short question. Uh, the two works you showed by Anthony Montades and Santiago Serra were both from 2005? Yeah. Were they yeah. part of a common project? Oh, okay. Or uh, yeah. there was, a, was there a okay. drive behind it? Mm. Because it's weird to have two artists who reflect on uh, the politics of biennials. Uh, yeah. This, this one uh, was in the Spanish pavilion. Yes, and Sierra? And the Sierra was in the Arsenal. In the Arsenal. Were they curated by the same person? No, no. They uh, were independent? Mm. Yeah. Um, what was the a, team of the, the Yeah, they are totally independent. Uh, the, in the Arsenal, there are uh, some national pavilions, and then a part uh, that is dedicated uh, to the general theme of the biennial, and the work uh, of Santiago Serra was uh, inside, uh, I mean, it belonged the to the general, sorry? What was the general theme in 2005? Um, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, the curator was uh, Rosa Martinez and Maria de Corral, but uh, I don't remember exactly the, 
the theme. Um, okay, yeah, it doesn't matter. Maybe there I are some. I know we, we are running out of time, but maybe there are that questions. I think we can check. Because we. Are there uh, questions, the question? Je sais qu'il est bien uh, tard, mais. Uh, yes, maybe. Uh, I would like to, to say that uh, the curator of Venice Biennial in 2005 uh, were uh, Rosa Martinez and Maria de Corral. And uh, um, uh, Rosa Martinez uh, was the curator of a Spanish National Pavilion in 2003, and the artist was Santiago Sierra. With the closed pavilion and the yeah. visa, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a metho methodological question, yeah, a classic one. Um, when, when you work on, on biennial, um, which is the, the place, uh, the, the analytical place that you give to artworks and artists, or uh, are you able to, since, uh, since the, the, the global circulations and the, the global circuits are one of your, your main uh, focus, are you able to also to follow artists and uh, singular artworks? I mean, working on this huge exposition, working on biennials, which is uh, um, how can you work also on the artistic content of this exp exhibition? Mm. Mm. Okay, uh, it's very difficult because I'm working with uh, a lot of biennials, so I'm. I'm researching the format. Um, I think that uh, one of the big uh, um, difficult that I have is uh, to study Latin American biennial from Spain. Uh, so I, um, I mean, I, it's not uh, too easy because uh, I don't have uh, the archive uh, in, the, in the city and I have to travel to, to the city. And uh, about uh, our study artists and, um, in, in a biennial, um, um, maybe Mm, you can choose an artist uh, and uh, so the and study the trajectory of the artist uh, through some biennial, but you cannot do it uh, with all the artists of a, a biennial because it's quite. I, I mean, it's very, 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 very difficult. And uh, you ask me something also about the context. No, uh, the content. Like uh, the content. When, when you're studying a biennial, the. Uh, how can you study also all the the artworks that are in there? Are, are you able to make a judgment about the the, the content of uh, the expositions of the exhibitions? Yes, from a gener generical point of view, or maybe if we are uh, go back to the third edition of uh, Avana Biennial. Now I. I'm very interested about uh, photos, uh, photo censurada de, de Chile, um, um, photo uh, ch censorship. Of, uh, how can I say you don't? Uh, um, um, this exhibition is about uh, some uh, some photo. Of, uh, of Chile, and uh, I'm very interested in, uh, in it uh, because uh, this exhibition in Havana is organized uh, from uh, a committee in favor of Chile from uh, uh, German. So the photo are sent, the exhibition are organized uh, by, uh, by this committee from, from German. So I can think that uh, um, of course, you can study, study the third edition of uh, Havana Biennial in deep, but if you want to study a uh, various edition of the Biennial, you can choose uh, some exhibition that you consider it important. I think that 
uh, you need to know the biennial in general term and then do a, a selection of the exhibition, the artist, the art pieces that you are interested to. Okay, thank you. Vu qu'il est tard, je pense qu'on va peut-être continuer la discussion de manière informelle. Uh, je voudrais remercier nos deux intervenants. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, we can go on, but in a more informal way. I don't, cannot keep people. And thank you for staying.